Hello again, and welcome back uh, to this science seminar. Um, the next speaker I'd like to introduce is Dr. Chuck Blatchley. He's going to speak about the beginnings of wave mechanics. So we've now gone from the biggest and longest and slowest cycles in the universe to the fastest ones, the tiny oscillations of particles. Uh, Dr. Chuck, Chuck Blatchley is a professor emeritus and the former chair of the Department of Physics and Chemistry at Pittsburgh State University in Kansas. He earned his PhD in nuclear and particle physics from Louisiana State University in 1984, based on experiments in high energy electron scattering in the MIT Bates LINAC. Is that how you say that? Yes. <laughs> Dr. Blatchley taught both undergraduate and graduate quantum mechanics for 25 years. And he didn't put, he didn't mention this, but I want to mention this. Uh, he participated uh, in some NASA projects as well to do with the space shuttle and other things. So, uh, so, and, and Chuck has been with the, uh, with the Cycles Research Institute since its formation as our physics advisor. Thank you, Chuck. Well, thank you, Ray. Um, I wanna thank the foundation for inviting me to put my two cents in here. Uh, over uh, many years, uh, at least a decade or so, uh, Ray and I have had many uh, uh, in enriching and stimulating uh, exchanges. We don't always agree on some of the fundamentals, but uh, the, the discussion of it was always uh, uh, very enriching. I, I would hope for him as well as for me. My side was always uh, uh, to look at the more conventional uh, accepted uh, state of physics because uh, that's what I teach and that's what I use in my, used in my research. Um, so I want to go back and kind of go over that, uh, the, the, uh, to take a look at the beginning of wave mechanics, because one of the key ideas here is that just about everything involves waves or cycles. And so, so the details of how that plays out, what, what things are correlated and what things may not be, uh, that, that's, I'm not going to go into that, but I just want to go back and look at where this idea uh, really started. So uh, let's bring this up. Did I, I took the wrong one, I think. There we are. Okay. So what's the connection between uh, uh, cycles and waves? If I, if I look at this uh, in a very simple way, uh, probably the prototypical uh, cycle would be the simple harmonic oscillator. If you put a, a weight on a string and let it bob up and down, uh, this, this describes simple harmonic motion. If you run a piece of paper beside that, you generate a wave, a sinusoidal wave. And in fact, uh, whichever uh, level of mathematical description you use for the simple harmonic oscillator and the wave, whether simple algebra or whether you, you jump all the way into differential uh, equations, uh, the parameters of those two are uh, intimately related in that the, uh, the, the frequency, the amplitude and so on, the period um, of, the, of the simple of the cycle and the wave are connected. And of course, there's more complicated versions. You can have two uh, waves that are identical moving in opposite directions that creates a standing wave, which recovers uh, the simple harmonic oscillator. So the, the two are very uh, intimately related. So let me go back to the, the very earliest uh, discussion about this. There was an ongoing argument in the sciences over centuries and uh, Isaac Newton in his uh, seminal uh, optics discussion uh, declared that he thought light was made of little particles and it was the shape of these particles whether they were sharp and pointy or smooth and, and uh, streamlined that determined uh, how they interacted with, uh, for example, the prism and, and broke into different colors. So, so colors of light to him had to do with the, uh, the shape of the particles. And his view uh, kind of dominated. He was a very bright guy, and so uh, uh, people accepted uh, his view of, of light for, for many, many years, until in the middle uh, of, the 18th, of the 19th century, rather, they started to switch over to um, uh, the wave view began to dominate. Uh, 
and a lot of that was due to uh, this uh, physicist uh, Thomas Young. Incidentally, he's the one that that uh, uh, first gave us a translation of hieroglyphs out of Egypt. Uh, but that's that's another story. Anyway, he found that if you put light through two different two, through two slits, uh, you could create an interference pattern that's shown there on the screen. Uh, and that interference pattern showed that you had waves going through the slits. If you uh, change the frequency, you change the pattern of interference, and you could in fact uh, get the parameters of the waves that we talked about a second ago uh, from this interference pattern. And so interference was, was a, a very clear indication of waves. Another property of waves is when they, when they go around a sm an object around the size of the uh, wavelength, you get diffraction. And the diffraction going through a slit also creates an interference pattern. And so that's why you have, in this case, you have light and dark areas. And within those light and dark areas, you have lumps and the lumps are from uh, the diffraction pattern. So again, diffraction and interference uh, were key properties of waves. And so gradually his idea uh, uh, caught up. In the, by the middle of the 19th century, um, we come to a series of, of people who worked with um, another view of light. Uh, this was kind of put together by James uh, Clark Maxwell. And uh, uh, Helmholtz also got some credit for this. In fact, Helmholtz uh, uh, seems to have, he, he thinks he discovered it at the same time that Maxwell did. But Maxwell basically took um, uh, laws of electricity and magnetism that uh, had been discovered in the first half of the 19th century, uh, particularly Faraday's law of induction, uh, which, which tells us about magnetic fields and allows us to look at, to construct generators. And then Ampere's force law, which gives us uh, uh, motors, it works the opposite direction. You have a, a current that can produce a force, can produce a magnetic field. Um, and it, the Lorentz force, which the, the formula, the Maxwell kind of used the Lorentz force, but he was really talking uh, at the time, they really didn't know about Lorentz. They were talking about Gauss's law being applied to magnetic fields and then Gauss's law applied to electric fields. Anyway, Maxwell took these, uh, this, these sets of laws and uh, came up with a list of about 20 uh, equations. I think it was 18 or 20 equations, uh, very complicated, uh, interactive, uh, linked equations. And Oliver Heaviside, uh, mathematician, looked at that and realized he could uh, uh, compact that using a newly uh, uh, developed uh, vector notation. And so Heaviside was the one that really uh, put Maxwell's equations in the form uh, that we're more familiar with today. Uh, we typically teach it in two different forms. One is in, in integral differential equation, and the other is, uh, uh, in, uh, is in derivatives or differentials. And so uh, that boiled this down to basically four equations. And if you took uh, one of those equations and substituted it into one of the others, you derived what everyone recognized as a wave equation. And so this really solidified uh, what they had noticed from Young's experiments. And so that gave us this view of uh, electromagnetic propagation of, of a, a wave of light. Now, when I say light uh, or electromagnetic wave, I'm talking about a vast range. Uh, uh, this is the, the scale across the top. Notice that's in powers of 10. And the visible uh, part of that spectrum uh, is pretty narrow. The colors up there indicate where uh, the light that we can see is. And the shorter ones, you get down into uh, ultraviolet fairly quickly and then into X-rays and then finally uh, at the far end, you get uh, gamma rays, which are very uh, short wavelength, very high frequency waves. At the other end, you go uh, to, uh, to infrared and then in eventually into microwaves and then radio waves. And then at the far end of that, they're very uh, low frequency uh, radio waves that can actually propagate through uh, ocean water. Now, the, all of these share this common diagram that I have at the bottom here. Uh, it shows sinusoidal waves, sort of, 
<clears throat> this is sinusoidal, but the waves don't necessarily have to be that precise. They can have a carrier frequency. They can be uh, modulated, and, and you can come up with a number of different patterns, repeating patterns of wave. But you have the electric field in one direction, and you have the magnetic field in a perpendicular direction. And then, of course, you can make these patterns rotate. You can have circular polarization and have these the directions of these these various vibrations, uh, the waves uh, rotate around the axis of propagation. Uh, and you can also have combinations. You can have, have uh, waves that, that uh, coincide. Now, the seminal thing about this description that we're, gonna, we're going to, to modify in a second is that the wave appears to be continuous to an arbitrary length. Okay. In other words, uh, when you generate a radio wave, uh, it keeps going. It doesn't. It doesn't cut off. It, uh, when you turn, when you hit the button to turn it on, it keeps going until you take the power back off. Okay. And so light was assumed to be the same kind of continuous thing. It did have one one very important property though, and that is when you looked at the light coming from uh, a pure gas. Uh, in this case, uh, I have hydrogen up there as a gas, you get a unique combination of the colors. Now, this, this actually goes down uh, uh, into the, the uh, well, no, that's not near infrared, but at the other end, you, you get uh, ultraviolet. And you have these patterns within this apparent barcode, uh, the spectrum that was characteristic of that gas. In other words, each gas that you put in there produced a different fingerprint, a different barcode, if you will, of, uh, of light colors. And you could extend this uh, today in astronomy. We extend this out uh, much further. We look all the way down into the radio spectrum uh, and clear up into the, uh, the X-ray, uh, getting the spectrum uh, that is characteristic of the matter that the light is coming from. Now, how does how do how do we see this? The the, the couple of different ways to generate a spectrum. Uh, the middle one here is what I was just talking about: the emission spectrum. This is where you have a thin gas that is somehow excited, maybe by electrical discharge or by extreme heat, and so the gas emits these characteristic lines. The dark. The dark areas in between are areas where light is not emitted. But if you took a, a, a dense object, uh, say a, a, a poker coming out of, a, out of your fireplace that was starting to glow red, that would be a continuous spectrum. You'd, have, you'd see uh, a range of colors in there. The hotter it got, the more you'd see at the blue end. And the cooler uh, it was, the, the more you'd see at the red end. But if you took a continuous spectrum, and passed that spectrum through uh, the thin gas, then you get an absorption spectrum. So for example, an incandescent light bulb produces a continuous spectrum. If you run that through a, uh, a prism to separate the colors as Newton did, you see the continuous spectrum. If you take a thin hot gas, you see the emission spectrum when it goes through the prism or, or uh, we have other ways to, to separate the spectrum now besides a pr glass prism. But a glass prism was, was early on a uh, simple way to do it. Um, or you could pass the uh, continuous spectrum from the incandescent lamp through a cold gas, and then you would see an absorption spectrum. Now notice that the lines of the absorption spectrum line up with the emission spectrum. This is assuming we have the same gas in the cold case versus the hot case, okay? The absorption lines line up with the emission spectrum. So again, this was modeling light as a continuous emission, and they had no idea why gases produced these spectra. It was a, a, a mystery uh, for many years, okay? But there were a couple of other mysteries that were, were gathering momentum, as Lord Kelvin said around 1900, uh, he saw two dark clouds on the horizon of physics. Uh, the first one was the luminiferous ether. This was something that Newton proposed. He didn't like the idea of the wave theory at all. And he said, in order to have waves, 
you have to have a medium. You have to have a medium that propagates waves. And he called this the luminiferous ether. And the problem is by 1900, uh, experiments were showing that there didn't appear to be a medium for light. Somehow light propagated uh, without the properties of this magical fluid uh, that the earth would presumably be passing through. So that was one of the, the puzzles that was, was bothering them in addition to the, the spectrum. And the other one was a mystery with the spectrum that came out of what you call a black body. Now a black body uh, is a material that emits a con the continuous spectrum uh, with no gaps in it. If you take a real object and heat it up till it glows, uh, there might be some little defects in that continuous spectrum. But if you take a, a, a hollow chamber, it acts very much like an object that is perfectly black. And uh, a perfectly black absorber is also a perfect emitter. And so they expected uh, the, this uh, hollow chamber would act like a very black piece of material. Well, the theorists got the hold of this. Uh, Rayleigh uh, was one of them, Jeans was another. And they said, if the light bouncing around in this little chamber uh, is acting like a little simple harmonic oscillator, if it, if it was a cyclic uh, device that was somehow emitting uh, the light, if it was a little piece of charge, somehow charge was being moved back and forth to emit this light, then within this continuous spectrum, uh, the energy ought to spread to all of the colors. In fact, it ought to start the energy, this was called the uh, equipartition theorem, the way little harmonic oscillators work when they're connected, is they share the energy. And so the higher frequencies ought to gradually pick up as much energy as the low frequency. Now this has the paradoxical uh, uh, conclusion or leads to a paradoxical conclusion that when you build a charcoal grill fire, that charcoal ought to start emitting x-rays after a short time, that the wavelength ought to get shorter and shorter and shorter as the charcoal heats up. And that isn't what they observed. What they observed with careful measurements of, of uh, uh, dark emitters is they had, they followed this curve that I've indicated is the experimental data. The theoretical curve uh, goes up. In other words, they call this the ultraviolet catastrophe because it, it suggested that the very short wavelengths ought to take off and they clearly don't. You don't have to wear uh, a lead apron to, uh, to, to cook that steak. So the question was, what's wrong with the theoretical analysis that leads to the Rayleigh genes uh, uh, explosion, the, the ultraviolet uh, catastrophe? The guy that came up with a way to solve this was uh, Max Planck. Now, he was a mathematical physicist, and so he used a mathematical trick. He said, let's take the... Um, uh, the equations that the theorists start out with for the linkage between the uh, simple harmonic oscillators. And I'll stick a little extra constant in there. Then I'll go through the, the mathematical manipulations that let me solve this and I'll get the right answer. And then I will let that little constant go to zero. Okay, so, so this, this sounded like a reasonable trick. You put a little extra constant in there, that lets you solve the equation very, very precisely, very easily, and then you pull that constant back out at the end. Well, the only problem was the little constant wouldn't go away. He couldn't, he couldn't pull that constant out. Uh, in fact, the, the, it had to have a very specific value. And so um, what he realized was he was dividing uh, that spectrum up into little increments of energy instead of a continuous spread of energies between the simple harmonic oscillators, uh, they each had to allow only a little chunk of energy, he called it a quantum of energy, that was proportional to the frequency. So he wrote the equation, the energy of the photon E 
has to equal his mysterious constant that he couldn't make go away has to equal the energy has to equal that constant times the frequency in cycles per second okay so this was a very odd result he was very frustrated that he couldn't make the frequency that little pulse go away but by leaving that little tiny chunk of energy in there by dividing the light up into little chunks he recovered the exact spectrum and in fact his formula produced the curves that uh, you see there plotted showing the the, the intensity or in this case radiancy watts per square meter uh, uh, for each temperature. As temperature goes up, you get more and more of the blue and ultraviolet. And in fact, if you go up high enough, you start to get x-rays and uh, uh, gamma rays. Now that's something that happens near uh, stars in the atmosphere of the sun. In fact, you get uh, uh, x-rays coming out of the surface of the sun uh, where the temperature is, is well above the average temperature. Now the average temperature of the surface is the 6,000 Kelvin range. And that, so that's what gives us, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the 5,000 Kelvin. That's what gives us our visible spectrum. It's kind of evenly balanced. If you look at the light coming from the sun, uh, it, it basically covers the equal parts red and, and violet, which our vision is attuned uh, to see. When you go to higher temperatures, you get up above the surface of the sun, then you get these shorter wavelengths. Now this is kind of a puzzle. How do you have little quanta of light uh, when we thought the model was a continuous spectrum? So, so if you look up at the top here, here's the continuous uh, wave. Um, and you can see that, that uh, uh, the, the frequency, you could set up, pick, pick a frequency and, and uh, uh, if you want to transmit energy using that wave, you just give it enough time. If you need more energy to make a phenomenon happen, uh, you just let that wave keep coming in until you accumulate enough energy to, to uh, kick over the, the threshold that you want. Well, things don't behave that way. And I'll show you in a minute uh, uh, a phenomenon where that comes into play. And that, in fact, was what Einstein got his Nobel Prize for. So how do we have little packets of wave, okay? Well, down here at the bottom, here's one way. There, this is not the only one, there's different ways to do it, but this particular uh, wave packet kind of has a Gaussian envelope over the carrier frequency uh, that is the, the, uh, the frequency that Planck came up with. So somehow light knows how to shape its packet to shape its uh, uh, form so that you limit the energy to that finite little chunk. And yet you have the frequency, the wave behavior that comes with what is under that, uh, that Gaussian uh, uh, envelope, okay? So this is, this is a new way to view light is that it comes in little packets and again, Planck called those uh, quanta. Now this was this view was just catching on. It had been around for, for about a decade. Uh, when Louis de Broglie in 1924, now he was the interesting thing about him, he was the prince, uh, but he was uh, uh, earning his PhD in his, his, at Paris, the Paris, University of Paris. And in his 1924 thesis, he came up with this hypothesis. Now we know the E equals uh, the Planck's constant times the frequency applies to light. He said, what if that applies to electrons as well? Now, uh, Ray likes to, to, to there's, a, there's a theory that Ray is fond of that, that uses that HF and says that a, 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 an electron at rest then has this intrinsic frequency. But de Broglie uh, uh, didn't publish it that way. He instead inverted that and said that the wavelength is equal to Planck's constant divided by the momentum. So think about this for a second. He's saying that the particle has a wavelength 
that is intimately connected to its momentum. The higher the momentum, the shorter the wavelength. Okay. Well, this was confirmed almost immediately by uh, the Davis and Germer experiment. That was where they fired electrons of a particular energy onto a crystal of nickel. And sure enough, they got a diffraction pattern and the wavelength that was associated with that diffraction pattern matched de Broglie's thesis, his hypothesis that somehow the particles had a wavelength inversely proportional to uh, the momentum. And it involved, it used uh, Planck's little tiny constant, the little h there, okay? So for this, uh, de Broglie got the 1929 Nobel Prize because he discovered the wave nature of electrons. This was not universally accepted, however. Uh, Max von Laue, uh, who did a lot of, of wave studies with, with uh, x-rays, he said, if that turns out to be true, I'll quit, okay? I'll quit physics. Uh, he, it turns out he, he did not quit, but it did turn out to be true. It was verified um, in, a, in a number of ways that electrons indeed have properties of waves when you uh, look for waves with a diffract, something that creates a diffraction pattern, okay? Now, at the same time, uh, the atom was just becoming uh, accepted. And this, the, uh, uh, tragically, uh, a number of people uh, uh, who worked with the idea of atoms uh, uh, were rejected and, and uh, Boltzmann, for example, committed suicide over it. Uh, but the, as atoms came to be accepted, uh, they also recognized that the atom was not the ultimate uh, in, in elemental or not a fundamental type of unit, that there were smaller things because uh, in 1897, the electron was discovered and they were able to measure uh, the, actually the mass to uh, uh, charge ratio but eventually we're able to figure out the electron mass and clearly it uh, came out of atoms, went back into atoms. And so the atom must have some kind of structure. And the question is, can we define that? And can we explain those mysterious spectra? Okay, the guy that, that came up with a, an explanation of this was uh, Niels Bohr. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flash some uh, uh, symbols up here, a little bit of algebra, uh, if you can just bear with for a second. Ironically, his picture did match pretty closely the, um, the hydrogen spectrum. So he was talking about a hydrogen atom. Now, the, the way we look from uh, orbital mechanics is you have, if something's in a circular orbit, we're going to picture the electron going around the nucleus, like a planet going around the sun in a circular orbit. Uh, the electric force depends on the charge on the nucleus. Now we can write that with atomic number times the charge on the electron. For hydrogen, that capital Z there, the charge, the, the atomic number is one. So that kind of goes away. But what Bohr said is what if uh, uh, Planck's, um, quantization of light energy applied here. And so let's, what if the momentum of the electron in this orbit around the sun uh, was also quantized? So he took angular momentum, that's the mass times the velocity in the orbit times the radius of the orbit, MVR. He said, what if that is integer multiples of Planck's constant? And I'm fudging a little bit here, the Planck's constant I'm using is slightly different. This is, this is the original one divided by their head times two pi, but, but that's because we've got two pi times the radius is the, uh, uh, is the circumference. Okay, so anyway, the, for circular orbit, the electrostatic force, uh, which is the, the product of the two charges divided by R squared, K is just an electrostatic constant. Uh, in some systems of units, you can make K be one, make Z be one, that simplifies all this. Uh, anyway, he takes that uh, quantized angular momentum in, in uh, 
integer multiple of h times uh, the MVR, plugs that into the orbital equation, and he derives energy levels, the allowed energy levels for, from quantized momentum as going as one over n squared, okay? And it turns out that the transitions between these energy levels, not the energy levels themselves, but the transition between these levels very closely approximates the energy in the hydrogen spectrum. I'll tell you why I say closely approximates it. So then is about eight years later, Bohr recognized that using de Broglie's uh, uh, momentum and wavelength, uh, this implied that you had an integer number of half wavelengths in each of these orbits, okay? So you can draw this picture of the electron going around the sun like a planet around, or electron around the nucleus, like the uh, planet going around the sun except that now instead of a planet, you have this wave going around and you have to be able to fit the wave exactly into that orbit. Otherwise there's interference. And if there is, there's interference, then that means the electron isn't there anymore. It has to go somewhere else, okay? So this was the picture that, that Bohr had created. And, and the idea of the electron going around the nucleus being like a planet or analogous to a planet going around the sun was very tempting. It's very easy to draw this and therefore um, it caught on. And today, frustratingly, um, it is very much uh, the picture that uh, teachers uh, give in, in very introductory science classes is this analogy to planets. Unfortunately, Bohr's theory was almost immediately shown to be uh, incorrect. Now, he, as I said, he did get the approximate uh, spectrum coming out of hydrogen to be correct, because that was the differences between uh, these energy levels. But there were a number of problems that, that within a year, his theory had been dumped, okay? First off, the energy levels had to be corrected. You use uh, the reduced mass formulas for uh, uh, planetary orbits. Now the, the, the ratio between the sun's mass and a planet's mass is so huge, uh, you, can, you can kind of ignore that. But in the case in the atom, that's not the case. You have to use a reduced mass for the electron to make this work exactly. But there were, even when after you do that, there's problems. For example, it predicts, Bohr's model predicts that for the ground state, okay, when n is one, the ground state says that the angular momentum uh, is a, it has to be an integer multiple of h bar of h. So angular momentum has to be one times h. It's not. Plenty of experiments by then proved that the angular momentum of the ground state is actually zero. So that's wrong. It also relies on discrete orbital paths with no uncertainty, okay? This, this kind of went out the window very quickly. It also failed to explain fine structure, the hyperfine structure and Zeeman splitting. That's what happens when you put the atom in a magnetic field. And it doesn't work at all for multi-electron atoms and it doesn't explain chemical bonds. So there were lots of problems with Bohr's theory. It was almost immediately thrown out, but if you, you ask an elementary school kid, to draw a picture of an atom, he's probably going to draw a planet going around the sun. So two guys were involved with, with fixing this. The first one was Werner Heisenberg. Uh, and uh, he did, uh, he went off to a mountaintop and came down from the mountain with a quant, with a, a uh, matrix analysis of these spectra. And Schrodinger did a very similar thing, except he used, uh, uh, a differential equation and the solutions were uh, integrals, okay? And it turned out they both came up with the same results. It matched hydrogen exactly. It explained the fine splitting. It explained Zeeman. Uh, the the uh, thing is when they got together at the Solvay conference in the 20s, they realized they got the same answer, even though one used matrix multiplication and the other one used integrals. Uh, and so this, this is what ultimately became uh, the model for the atom 
uh, that succeeded. But this is hard to draw, and I'll show you why in just a second. Anyway, uh, Schrodinger didn't like what later came out of quantum mechanics, especially the Bohr uh, uh, description, because they called it the Copenhagen description of quantum mechanics. So he said he didn't like any of that, and he's sorry he ever had anything to do with it. So here's what the real answer should look like, okay? This is the standing wave uh, of the ground state. And as you can see, the electron spends most of its time, the brightest part, it spends most of its time right on top of the nucleus. And it gets thinner as you go out. Now this is kind of the opposite. If you had an orbit, if you had a planet going around the sun, it would spend most of its time uh, in, a, in, a, in a, a ring going around and it wouldn't, it wouldn't go into the center at all. So you might think of this as well, this is a, the electrons like on a rubber band and it's getting pulled into the center, goes through the center, comes back out the other side. But even that isn't a good model because with that you spend most of your time on the periphery of the sphere. And again, very little time at the middle uh, where, you're, where it's moving fast. This is what the first excited state looks like. Now this is a little bit more like what Bohr had. Now if you can picture, this kind of rotating in and out of the, the picture, it's a donut, okay? So the nucleus is at the center. In this state, the electron uh, again doesn't go through uh, the center very much. It does kind of stay around an orbit, but notice how that's all flared out above and below the, uh, the horizontal there. And this is, this is a, a very unexpected, strange pattern that, uh, uh, a particle in a clear trajectory would not have. You have to have standing waves uh, to make this happen. Uh, Feynman, Feynman said, uh, since it's, we can't make, he was talking about making a physical model, since we can't make a physical model that resembles this very well, um, uh, theoretical physics has given up and they just work with the mathematical model. Okay, so back to light. Do we have a particle or a wave? Okay, if it's a particle, you have particle-like interactions. And that's where I did a lot of my research was, was scattering very high energy electrons off of uh, things in the nucleus. And when it's scattered, you could, you could actually measure the size of the things that were scattering it, the atoms, the nucleons, the uh, uh, things within the atoms. Uh, and you can measure the size of the, the projectile as well, the electron. I'll show you those in a second, okay? So it's quantized. Photoelectric effect, I'll show you in just a second. That also shows particle effects. So scattering shows particle effects. And again, if you have a, a double slit, but you allow some sort of interaction with one side of the slit, then you get particle interactions on the other side. On the other hand, if you configure your experiment to look for waves, you can see diffraction, refraction, uh, interference effects. You can see uh, beats. We didn't talk about that with waves, but if you put two waves together, you get beat frequencies. Uh, and then the uncertainty principle, of course, uh, uh, didn't have time to really go into that in any detail, but you can also have coherent scattering, which says the, the way the wave uh, behaves, gives you, it'll scatter to one place, but not to another, again, because of interference. Uh, and if you have a double slit without interaction, you clearly get those effects. So here's what, here's the, the photoelectric effect. I said, this was the, uh, the, uh, the really high evidence of a particle effect. And Einstein got the Nobel prize for this. Basically the experiment, if you look at the left-hand bulb over here on, on the, the far left side, you have a vacuum tube where light of, of variable frequency falls on a particular metal, in this case, zinc, okay? And uh, you can put a charge on the collector, the C up there, E is the emitter, C is the collector. You can put a charge on the collector that actually uh, repels and holds uh, electrons back, okay? So if you have enough, enough charge on that, then, then, or if you have no light at all, then you have uh, no current. On the other hand, if you, if even with a repelling uh, charge up there at the top, it's possible for the light to kick out electrons and still have a current, okay? And it turns out that the light uh, has to have a threshold frequency, a short enough wavelength to make that work. 
So if you look at the horizontal axis on the plot over here, that 10.4 uh, uh, is in electron volts. Uh, that's roughly the threshold for creating a current. And if you go above that, the higher you go, the more current you get, uh, but you or the higher the stopping voltage has to be to stop the current. And Einstein wrote that down as a very simple equation. He said the zinc material has a, a he called it a work function, W, work function at the surface that held electrons in, and you had to get enough energy in each photon of light, each uh, quantum of light, the H times the frequency, to exceed that threshold uh, to get a current in spite of the stopping voltage. And of course, the, uh, the higher the frequency, the greater that uh, uh, stopping voltage had to be to stop it. So Einstein correctly explained this photoelectric effect that had been puzzling people for years. And for that simple equation at the bottom, HF minus W, that's what he got his Nobel Prize for. A lot of people think he got the Nobel Prize for something to do with relativity, but it was really for this photoelectric effect, okay? So here's some examples of what electrons do uh, when they hit materials, uh, different crystals. Uh, they cre they create these at interference patterns. And as, as Ray mentioned in the introduction, we're talking about wavelengths that are tiny. He was talking about wavelengths that span uh, galaxies. This spans um, uh, interatom interatomic spacing or even inside the electron, if you're inside the atom, if you get the electron uh, going fast enough. So transmission electron microscopy at the top, I borrowed this from uh, uh, the National Institute uh, of Science and Technology. Uh, uh, polycrystalline silicon gives you uh, uh, rings, interference rings, instead of little dots. If you have a, a crystalline material, like at the top, you get little uh, tiny dots. Uh, the object on the right, you can see the diffraction pattern that you typically see in electron microscopes uh, that is associated with uh, the, the hard edges. The, that material is not wavy, okay? The waviness comes from the electrons demonstrating their, their uh, wave properties. Okay, so when you go to measure particles from uh, the way they collide, we come up with some very curious, uh, uh, curious range of numbers. The electron is smaller than 10 to the minus 18 meters. We can't get down small enough to see the electron. We just know it's smaller than 10 to the minus 18. And if, you, if you've played with any of these subatomic dimensions, you know that is about as close to the Greek ideal of a point as we can probably get with any of our, our uh, instruments. The proton, on the other hand, is much larger. Notice that's about a that's at least a thousand times larger than the limit. It's about 10 to the minus 15 meters. It's, it's about a femtometer. Uh, atoms, on the other hand, are on the order of uh, 10 to the minus 10 meters. So they're about 5,000 times larger. So that electron in its orbits, uh, in its uh, uh, cloud around the nucleus, produces an atom. Most atoms are about the same size. Atoms are about 5,000 times larger than what's in the nucleus. Proteins, on the other hand, are another couple of orders of uh, magnitude larger than that. Okay, so one of the things that comes out of this, I was talking about, the, I mentioned the uh, uh, uncertainty principle, is that it's impossible to know certain things at the same time with arbitrary accuracy. So the first one of these, the one that's usually mentioned is momentum and position. You can, you can know one with very high accuracy, but then the other one becomes an unknown so that the product of these two uh, is on the order of Planck's constant. But there are other things that have this property of complementarity that uh, uh, Bohr recognized. Energy in a time interval, that leads to some very odd phenomena. Uh, you can talk about the frequency domain and the time domain in electronic communications. Those are also complementary. And the, and the three key property of all of these is you can make a Fourier transform from one side to the other. and uh, and, and change which one dominates. Spin uh, around one axis is complementary to spin around different axes. This leads to uh, a number of, of uh, strange phenomena. Uh, you could have total angular momentum versus total angular momentum around a different axis. And then light, of course, polarization uh, around orthogonal axes. Okay, so when we say this, this wave property of matter, what type of wave are we talking about? 
it's not like a physical wave. The Schrodinger equation produces solutions that are almost always complex functions. Now that doesn't mean uh, they're, they're intricately tangled up. What it means is uh, these are functions with both real and imaginary parts. So if you're gonna deal with this, you're gonna have to go back and, and learn about uh, imaginary numbers in uh, uh, mathematics because these are complex functions, which means you have to square the function to make sense to extract information from it, okay? Uh, this also leads to the way idea that I like to think of it as probability. It's, if you look at something like nuclear decay, uh, it's truly probabilistic in the sense that we can't know. It's not that we don't know uh, the variables that are controlling it, but we simply cannot know. And this means that we can only have statistical knowledge of what these functions are doing at times. So some of the other weird uh, uh, phenomena that this leads to, and I see I'm, I'm about out of time, is for example, tunneling. Uh, particles can go where uh, we didn't expect them to. They can pass through barriers uh, that where a classical particle can't go. And that's because this complex wave can in fact pop up on the other side of the barrier and give us a finite probability of finding something on the other side. Now, the one that, that, that keep, causes a lot of people trouble is the fact that the, the uh, quantum function, this uh, state function, can actually travel faster than light and usually does, okay? So although the light wave is limited to the speed of light in the vacuum, the quantum mechanical wave that goes with these particles uh, can exceed light. Now, what, how's, doesn't that violate something? Well, in a way it does, but that's not transmitting information or the particle faster than light. It's transmitting uh, uh, information, unless you get to, we have some, some of these entanglement issues and with ambiguous states uh, uh, sorting out. And some of those actually do go faster than light because the wave function uh, drags them along. So without going into any more detail than that, I'm about to run over. Let me just ask if there are any questions that you'd like to uh, uh, jump into. Okay, let me get, stop sharing. Okay, there we go. Oh, sorry, um, hang on. Yeah, um, so Chris has asked, can you say where scalar waves fit in? I think that Tesla discussed those. Uh, well, yeah, certainly if you look at it, uh, if you look at a radio uh, uh, antenna transmitting to your, uh, to your uh, receiver, your television signals uh, in, inside a, uh, uh, a, a, a wave guide or what do you call it? The, uh, a reflected, in, internally reflective uh, device, total internal reflection. Uh, these are scalar waves because you can you can describe how how uh, the the quantum wave travels with the scalar wave. So so the the original concept of light as a scalar wave uh, has validity. It's when you get into the interactions with particles that you you have to discuss quantum mechanical waves. For example, when light uh, is say a gamma ray passes near a nucleus, it can spontaneously turn into a, a, an electron positron pair. Okay, this is called pair production. Uh, this is governed by the quantum mechanical wave, which clearly is comp complex. It's not, uh, it's not gonna use uh, uh, the, sc the scalar wave uh, kind of goes away at that point. Thanks. Thanks, Chuck. Let me thank you, Chuck, for your uh, wonderful talk. Uh, it was uh, covered a huge area uh, in a very clear way. Um, I, I particularly like that you started with the simple harmonic motion, because 
um, that's the basis of everything that's happening that you described there. But I believe that that is a basis of understanding all the cycles that we observe. So in every case, there's got to be a restoring force that's pro proportional to the displacement. And if we look for those mechanisms, it, it can apply to economics and other things as well, not just to physics and, uh, and uh, cosmology. So I think that's, that's wonderful. Um, that works even if it only even if the restoring force only approximates approximately sure yeah because generally it is only approximate like with a pendulum or something. Um, someone has asked, is Kurt, is it Kirchhoff or Kirchhoff's law false as Pierre Marie Robertale suggests? That's a curly one. I, I'm sorry, could you repeat? I didn't understand. That. Um, is Kirchhoff's law false as Pierre Marie Robertale suggests? Uh, oh, having to do with uh, uh, which Kirchhoff's law circuits or or black body emission because he had he's known for both uh, uh, black body emission he, his his what we what we often call Kirchhoff's law is that a good emitter is also or a good absorber is also a good emitter and and yes that has certain limitations but but uh, it, it, and it's kind of a general statement the other. Kirchhoff's law of circuits has to do with adding voltages and, and currents. Yeah. Um, someone's asking where you're hailing from, Chuck. I think we had that in the introduction, but. Well, I, this, I, I, I taught for uh, 25 years at Pittsburgh State University in Southeast Kansas. When I retired, I moved over to uh, Joplin, Missouri. So I'm in the middle of the continent. Um, it's, it's great. I think it's really good um the um the way you've given us the whole story of not only what's believed but why and the whole series of things there um and um i think the can the story obviously continues <clears throat> and i just wonder uh whether you've looked at the work of milo wolf at all uh yeah as, as i mentioned very early the the uh, de broglie's idea of uh, uh of, of saying that the rest mass energy, if the particle's at rest, then you should have a, an intrinsic frequency that, that uh, goes with the, the rest mass energy. And, and yeah. the, the, that, that act, actually led to a, an interesting uh, mathematical problem that was in an electrodynamics textbook, a famous one back in the, in the 60s. Uh, the guy asked, what kind of feel do you get if you have a, a, a very small metal that has charge that blinks on and off. And the answer is it doesn't radiate because, because the, the uh, charge is effectively there then it's not there. And so you have a radial distribution of charge, but it's, it's oscillating. So you could have a frequency, uh, say on a particle that, that indicates its, its charge is blinking on and off at a characteristic frequency. And then what Wolf, uh, did was to demonstrate that if you have that, then when the particle starts moving, you see uh, a phase shift that, because of relativity, uh, that corresponds to the change in wavelength with momentum. Yeah. Um, implies with De Broglie with uh, uh, Planck's law. It's worth looking at. Um, Gabriel Lafreniere made these wonderful animations that demonstrate those things. So by having the um, electron say as an incoming and outgoing wave, he showed that when it's moving, um, what happens, he does these animations and you can actually see all, all of um, uh, de Broglie's uh, waves there. You can see the, the wave that's traveling faster than the particle and the other ones. So all of that shows. So uh, I'd recommend people to look at that as well. Um, yeah, so, so, um, so um, th thank you very much, Chuck. Uh, I would like to, I'd like to talk sometime about radioactive K um, that you can't know. I know we have a little <laughs> disagreement about that, but that's for a future day uh, because, uh, uh, because that's an interesting subject with the, uh, what the Russians have done with the radioactive ones. And, and the West has now discovered that there is a dependency on the distance from the sun and radioactive decay. Um, okay, folks. I, I, I should say real quickly uh, before we go, um, uh, that if anyone is interested in finding out more of this, you're welcome to, to get in touch with me. Uh, but uh, I would certainly encourage you to join the foundation and, and 
and watch what is published there on the foundation website. Yeah, it just beat me to that. Yeah, thanks, Jack.